Hi, IED online students. Today is 824, and this video is for the A day of 824 and the B day of 825. So regardless of whether you're an A day online student or a B day online student, this video is for day two of class, and the content we're covering today is the design process. So there's no announcements for today, so we're just going to get started and jump right into it. I'm going to share my screen with you and show you how to get to today's lesson plan. So share screen. You want this one here, I believe. I think this is the right screen to share. So let's share this screen. Okay, so you should be looking at my screen now and we'll go to Canvas. If you go to, if you Google DSD Canvas, this is where you go and come down here to log in since you're a student. Once you've logged in using your credentials, you'll get to my class, which has the gears and the little hand touching them in the icon and you'll get to the main page here. So on the main page, we're gonna scroll down and we'll go to lesson plans. Today we're on this lesson plan. It says IED lesson plan 1.1.1 part one, design as a process. So we're gonna click on that and it will open up this lesson plan for today. So if you were an in-class student today, Ms. Meyerhofer and uh, Ms. Nielsen would come in to class and they spent several, probably about 20 minutes helping students log into DSD Canvas, get access to Weber State, um, uh, to be able to log in and check email and, and see Weber State Canvas. But since that's not being offered online, we're just gonna jump into our lesson for today. And please note that because this took so much time in class, <laughs> our lesson today is, is a little bit shorter. So I, I know you'll hate having a shorter lesson. The last video was quite long. Hopefully we, we kind of uh, uh, shorten that down for you a little bit. So we start every day with our big fat ACT prep book and we're doing some ACT math prep. And before we actually start working problems, we're going to learn strategies about how to read problems effectively and how to avoid some common mistakes. So we're going to be using the big fat ACT math book um, or just the, the big fat ACT book. It's called Barron's, the leader in test preparation. If you haven't already gotten one of these, I think the school gives you one for ACT prep for on-campus students. If you don't have one at home, not a big deal. I will figure out a way to put this on the on these videos so you can see them. Um, right now, I have a, I don't know if you can see this, but I have a uh, desk camera. Okay, I have a, okay. So in class, I put this up on the dot cam and people can see it on the screen. But today I'll just read to you from the book. So the first thing we're gonna go over here is that there's a few facts about the mathematical section on the ACT. Number one, it's 60 minutes long and it does have 60 questions. Of those 60 questions, 20 to 25% are from the pre-algebra category, 15 to 20% are from the elementary algebra category, and 15 to 20% are intermediate algebra, then 15 to 20% are coordinate geometry, then 15 to 20% are plain geometry, and then my favorite, trigonometry accounts for between five to 10% of the math section. What's important to know here is what's not listed, and that is calculus. There are no calculus questions on the ACT test. There's no differential equations, no linear algebra, so that's kind of cool. Next fact, the questions generally increase in difficulty from the beginning to the end. So if you want to just get the easy ones out of the way, and that's your strategy, start with those at the beginning. The harder ones tend to be towards the end. Again, there's no formulas provided. You have to bring your own. So if you want to know what the area of the triangle is and you need that formula, then you'll want to have memorized that it's one half base one half. No calculators provided, but you so you should bring your own. And there's a list of those that are prohibited. Um, it's at www.actstudent.org. Um, so like the TI-89, you can't bring that one. And those are some of the facts. Now, today we're just going to be introducing um, a few math strategies. The three biggest hurdles to high quality thinking on the ACT math test are number one, time management problems. Students spend way too much time on one problem or on specific sets of problems and they just don't have enough time to finish. You don't want to leave things blank on the ACT. Number two is overthinking questions. Questions are typically fairly straightforward and we're going to talk about this more in depth in subsequent lessons on at the beginning of the lesson when we talk about ACT prep. And then last, careless mistakes. That can catch all of us, and we're going to come up with some ways to help us uh, not have that happen to us. So um, that's just kind of an introduction for what we're covering as we go through our ACT prep, and we're going to go ahead and move on to the next part of the lesson.
So what are we doing and learning today? Well, today you'll get your PLTW notebook if you're in student class and we'll talk about the design process. And as always in class and online, we wanna give you, help you understand why we're learning what we're learning. So why should we care about getting our PLTW notebook and learning how to use it? And why should we care about the design process? How does it help us achieve our course goals? Well, let's go ahead and get into that. So I'm gonna go back to Canvas and on the main page here, it says course goals, models and rules. Remember under administrative documents and let's click on the course goals. So in class, we usually have a student read the goals off the wall and another student will explain how the lesson content for the day is helping us achieve those course goals. So course goal number one is safety first, always and forever. Today, there's no significant safety issues. I mean, be careful with the notebook. The, uh, you can get a paper cut from it, so just, just be careful. Uh, number two, get exposure to how engineering principles are applied in industry and use this experience to address whether a career in engineering may be a good fit for you. So in engineering, engineers always use engineering notebooks. I've been an engineer for the last 13 years and I've filled up many, many legal notepads, nothing as fancy as this notebook, but it's a great place to document all of our ideas and the design process we go through. It's also a great way to transfer projects. And we'll talk about that more in just a bit. But if you like keeping detailed records, this, is, this part of engineering should be appealing. If record keeping is not your forte, this is a chance to make some improvements. So let's see, the next goal here is to learn the course material and inventor slash Excel skills well enough to earn university credit and USB certificate earn the grade you want in this course and prevent school from getting in the way of our education. So in terms of getting a good grade in this course or the grade you want, um, there will be questions about the design process on the test and we'll cover those as we go through the course content today so you'll make sure to get all those right. All right, so we've talked about how the course goals align with the lessons content for the day. Let's go back to our lesson plan and let's get started. How will we know if we, well, before we jump into actually the lesson content, I like to have a way to measure if we're learning and doing things effectively. And in class, here's how we've done that. We'll have some conclusion questions at the end of class that you can help answer yourself and then I'll give some follow-up feedback on just here in the video. And we do a buddy check in our, uh, in class to make sure our notebooks are set up correctly. And then we have some class discussion with a friend, you know, how would you use an engineering notebook on the job? So that's how we're assessing our work today. So let's jump into it. Engineering notebooks. We're going to open this PowerPoint, which you don't have access to at PLTW because it's from last year's and it's just, they just did such a great job with it. I want to use it again this year. So from the lesson plan, you can click on this link and it will open up the PowerPoint that we're going to go through. All right. Um, first of all, this is the engineering notebook that you should be using this year. If you absolutely have to, you can go buy a notebook on Amazon or at Walmart, but it won't be as good as this one. This is a better engineering notebook than what you can get elsewhere because the pages are pre-numbered and you have alternating pages of graph paper. And so like page 10 will have uh, linear graph paper. Page 11 has orthographic graph paper and it just alternates between those two. Down at the bottom, you have, let's see if I can show you here. You have signature lines, you have a witness line, and you'll have to put those in manually if you don't get uh, this specific notebook. So please come to school and get this notebook. It's sitting on, in a box right as you walk into portable M5 here on campus. And you can just pick one up and you'll be in good shape. So make sure you do come and get one, please, so that you've got one. You'll want to start working in it right away. So in this notebook, um, we're going to cover these questions. You can pause and read these to yourself. So what is an engineering notebook? Well, it's a notebook where we keep track of all of our ideas, all the work on a progress, uh, all work on a project, and we document what's going on. And we do that for several reasons. One is for uh, transportability of projects. So if I was working on a project and I got reassigned, I quit, I went somewhere else, I was you know, asked to head a different project, I could hand the engineering notebook to you with all the notes in it that are clearly labeled. I've defined the problem. You know exactly what's going on in the project. But just by looking at my book, I can hand it to you. You can take it and continue on with the project. So we wouldn't have to have a project transfer meeting. You'd just be able to hit the ground running with my notebook. In engineering, that is a huge step. So it's also used as a legal document to um, make sure that you get credit for your work. And we'll talk about that more here coming up. So why would you want to keep one? Well, it's a legal document that's used to patent activities. And it proves that the 
origin of your idea led to the solution. It provides a timeline of events. It proves how hard you've worked in turning your idea into something that solves the problem. And it identifies when your idea became a real solution for the problem. For example, let's say you were working at the Huntsman Cancer Institute and you were working for a cure on cancer. Well, you would want to document all of your work in your engineering notebook. And let's say you're successful and you come up with the cure. Well, that's going to be worth a fair bit of money. And depending on your relationship with Huntsman Cancer Institute, what your contract looks like, you may own that intellectual property or they may own it. Regardless, this engineering notebook where you've done all your work is the legal document that proves it works, that has your ideas, that has where you wrote down the problem statement, what your ideas of this problem were, which one you chose, how you developed it, and how you iteratively went through that process again and again until you found the exact cure for cancer. And this is the notebook that would prove that it's yours. There are witness signatures at the bottom that would get signed on a daily basis to prove that your work was indeed yours. And this legal document identifies you as the person who cured cancer and you or the Huntsman Institute would get all the royalties, benefits, and patent rights. So you can see how this could be a really important thing. And since this, in, you know, in this class, we want to train you for industry, we're going to go ahead and start you working on an engineering notebook the right way. So the number one reason I return assignments to students is that they don't have those two signatures in the bottom page of this notebook filled out. Now, I'm not allowed to sign for you because I'm your teacher. You need to get a peer or a parent or someone to sign the witness signature for you. You're the designer, so you'll sign your name under the designer and provide the date. And then if you're working on this at home, um, a trusted adult or a friend or a sibling could sign for you who knows that you did the work and that'll that'll work out. So we talked about how this is a legal document and it provides continuity projects. Um, for engineering students, this is a great way to develop time management skills. You wouldn't want to spend all, of, if you notice that you're spending way too much time brainstorming ideas and not enough ideas developing, uh, not, not enough time developing solutions, this notebook um, will be a record of that. And you can look through your work and say, oh, I'm spending way too much time on this step of the process and not enough time on this step of the process. So this is a great way to record our activities and come back and it, it kind of gives us a little bit of biofeedback as to our, our work uh, process. We can use it to improve our research and our documentation and our communication skills. You may use this notebook and look at it and be like, you know what, I can't read anything that I've written in here. I need to increase the neatness and of my, my work. And then lastly, it's a basis for a professional presentation of work. The last step of the design process we'll talk about in a few minutes is presenting our work. And all of that comes from your engineering notebook. So what's going to be in your engineering notebook? What are the contents? Well, right here. You, this is where you discover the problem. You include your, your research. You have your sketches with labels and descriptions. By the way, a sketch without labels and descriptions really isn't helpful to anybody who just picks up your notebook and goes through it. This is where you catalog all of your brainstorming. You keep your calculations, including units, because if you just have a bunch of numbers out there, no one's going to know what they are. They need to be attached to a formula and have con show continuity of thought. This is where you record your daily thoughts and ideas. For example, you may be watching this video and you think, and your mind might wander a little bit. I, I know mine does sometimes watch some videos, but uh, you might be thinking, you know what? I've always wondered if we made the exhaust port on an engine where the, where the air comes out the exhaust valve and we made that an oval, would that increase throughput through the engine and give us more horsepower for the same amount of fuel we use? You might have just a tangential idea like that. And the engineering notebook is a great place to hurry and sketch that out so you don't forget it. You'll want to put pictures in there. There'll be times when we take pictures of our work. You'll take pictures of your engineering workbook and upload it to Canvas. There'll be times where you take pictures of your work and print it out and tape it in your engineering notebook. You'll want to make sure that any expert input that you get goes into your notebook. Let's say we have a guest lecture in class from Nutraceutical and they give you some great ideas about how you want to shape your engineering career or how you want to work on a specific project. Excuse me. You'll want to put that into your engineering notebook. Let's see, work sessions and meeting summaries. When you meet with your group on group projects, this will be the place to document your progress, what, what, what transpired, what was successful, and what the next steps are. Here you'll want to put in your test procedures, results, and conclusions. So the next time in class we meet, we will be doing an activity called the beanbag toss. And you'll be doing that at home. And this will be the place, you know, your engineering notebook will be the place where you document the progress you've made in that and you know how far your beanbag was able to launch and all that good stuff and all your ideas your brainstorming 
let's see, you'll have technical, digital technical drawings in here that you'll take pictures of and paste in, and we'll have this also be the place where you record your design modifications. Basically, everything you do or think related to a specific design project goes in your engineering notebook. All right, so in your engineering notebook, we will have a title page. We'll have a table of contents, and your title page should be very clear up here, and you should be able to see it. I'm going to pause this for a second. Okay, back here to our engineering notebooks. In the table of contents, you'll want to write down the page number, you'll have to record the title, and you'll have to record the date. Your table of contents looks like this, just like the one you see on the screen. And so those would be things that you'll need to put in. Today, we'll be working on the design process, so that could go in your title. Today, the page you'll start on will be page one, and today's date is 824. We're gonna fill this book out chronologically, and so we'll just kind of progress that way. In terms of a standard page layout, um, it's quad ruled paper, and that this notebook was selected because it was the easiest one for you to work in. So we've already got your page numbers up here. You can see like the number nine right there. You don't have to put your own pages, page numbers in. This is already done for you. And But you will have to put in your own dates, and you'll have to put in your own signature and your own witness signature. And we kind of talked through those ones. Some best practices here, all work is done in pen. Um, in other, and there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, in industry, especially when working with the FDA, you need to use pen so that they know you're not going back and erasing things and making corrections. If there does need to be a correction, you'll just put a line through what was wrong, sign it with your initials, and then write what was correct above it or below it so that we can see what the mistake was. In pencils, uh, when using a pencil, someone could have an eraser and erase what was there before, and that doesn't let us know what the previous erroneous entry was. We need traceability, and that's one of the big things that the FDA looks for when they came and audited us at Nutraceutical, was they wanted to see errors corrected on paperwork that specific way. And since that's a big trend in industry, we want to get you used to doing that here in class. So make sure you use a pen, not a pencil. I won't return your assignment to you if it's done in pencil, but I'll ask you to please use a pen next time. In other engineering classes here at New Ames, specific colors are required. And in this class, I don't care what color you use, just make sure it is a pen. Please don't use a marker that bleeds through the paper and kind of ruins you know, subsequent pages in your notebook. And let's see, please don't pull pages out of your notebook or put new pages in other than taping things in that we'll give you in class. So best practices, let's see. You always begin at the top of the page and you work left to right, so your flow kind of goes this way. If you can kind of follow my mouse across the screen here. And you don't want to leave any blank space. If you did, someone could go back there and put in work that's not necessarily yours. So you want to just want to draw a little line across it and sign it. If you're just going to burn some space and start on the next page for the next element in your book. Let's see. We talked about how to correct mistakes. You can see right here, uh, a student wrote Botox instead of Borax. And so they crossed it out with one line and signed it up here and wrote the correct thing above it. And that's exactly the right way we want to have to do that. Uh, we talked about why we did that just a second ago. Um, please don't scribble it out. If, if you scribble something out, then whoever's auditing your book will wonder what you're trying to hide, and that can launch further investigation, which, which is not necessary. Just, just put a line through it, and you're in good shape right there. Let's see. So you want to make sure there's a date on each entry, and that way we know when it was created for traceability. And in terms of uh, putting things in your notebook, you want to make sure that items are permanently attached. So please, it says glue is preferred. Glue is not preferred. Please don't glue anything in your notebooks because the glue can squish out between the pages and get on the previous page and make it difficult to open pages and separate them. So what we do is we just tape them. So you see here you've got a little bit of tape. Now when you come to pick up your engineering notebook, there is a little strip of paper called the design process next to it. Please tape that into page one in your engineering notebook. Let me go get a copy of it so you can kind of see what it looks like. So please pick up this piece of paper when you come into class. It's a little half sheet of paper and it tells you what the design process is and you can tape it in your notebook. If you can't come get it, then you need to uh, copy this image into it 
And but hopefully you're all coming in to get your notebook and you can put this piece of paper in there. So just tape it on page one. So if this were my engineering notebook, I would pull it up to let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here so you can see what we're doing here. What we're doing. All right, so if this is my engineering notebook, I'd open it to page one and I would get this piece of paper and I would tape it in right here. It doesn't fit horizontally, it just fits vertically. So tape it in here, you'll need it on the exam. And I tape it in just like this. And then over here in the notes section, I'd write down the definitions of what we're gonna cover here in a few minutes in class. That way you've got them for the test. So we'll go back to sharing. By the way, I'm getting better at this. I'm learning, I'm learning how to share the correct screen, like the right monitor, and to use the pause button, hopefully. Hopefully we're doing a better job. So let's go back to share screen. And we'll go back to what we were working on. All right, so um, make sure you sign your name so it extends across the notebook page of the inserted document so they know that you are the one who taped it in there. As we talked about earlier, make sure that you sign a date each page of the notebook before you start the next page. It's good just to sign it and you know that it's a good page for you to work on. Um, as a colleague, I shouldn't be the one, as a um, professor, I should not be the one signing your work. You should get someone else, a peer or some trusted adult or sibling to do the signing for you or a friend. And then make sure you store your notebook in a safe location. You'll have this to use on tests and if you lose the notebook, you can always come get a new one, but you won't be able to get a notebook that you've put all the writing into. Let's see, in terms of best practices, sketches, label parts of the sketch, describe each sketch. A sketch doesn't do any good unless we've got some notes in there. So we've got uh, too much friction right here on this one, right here, it says smaller, keep stirring for binding. This is what helps us understand what's going on here. So make sure that your sketches have some notes. Calculations and figures are clearly labeled. So if you've got some calculations here in your notebook, you need to make sure you use units and that you have written down what the formula is that you're using. Let's see. This is a place also to record your thoughts about the work you've done, whether it was successful, how it's, whether it was a failure, and what you think the next steps ought to be. As always, be neat, be accurate, be legible, be thorough. I'm not the only one who sees your engineering notebook. Um, the Utah State Board of Education audits these frequently, and as does the Weber State Engineering Department to determine if they want to continue to offer college credit for this course. So we used to have students store their notebooks in class, and then after school, the auditors would come in and take a look through them. Instead, we've given you the convenience of taking this class online and working from home, but you'll be taking several digital pictures of your work from your notebook and uploading them to Canvas. And you should know that the USBE and WSU have access to our Canvas course and can look through your work. So please be neat, accurate, legible, and thorough so we can continue to offer this course for other students for college credit. Here's a few examples of engineering notebooks. This is the guy who developed Tupperware. His name was Earl Silas Tupper. And here is one of his page entries for a paint pot. You can see it's back from March 14th, 1939. He put the date in there so we knew when his work was done. He developed a wide range of inventions, but it's kind of fun to see how other engineers are using engineering notebooks. So here's another example from Everett Bickley. And this is the drawing for a mechanical flycatcher back from 1943. By the way, one of his more lucrative inventions, you know, ones that made him a lot of money, was a device that sorted beans and separated the good ones from the bad. So here's another example from uh, Howard Head. This is from the Head Tennis Company, where they made a oversized tennis head, and it made the sweet spot a little bit bigger. You know when you hit a tennis ball and it, and it doesn't go off the frame, it doesn't go off the edge of the string, it hits the, the middle. That works out quite well. It gives the player a little bit more control. It also gives players who are some developing some uh, strength a, a little bit more power in the racket. So this has been a great invention, and, and uh, it's been a good one. Anyway, um, we're not going to use a course binder in this. Uh, course at all we're just going to be using the engineering notebook and so we've covered these points here and here are the references if you're interested in looking them up i'm going to stop let's see let's go back to our lesson plan and now that we've gone through here let's let's ask a few questions about this what would happen if you lost your engineering notebook the night before a test it wouldn't wouldn't go well for you because you wouldn't have it for you the next day so make sure you keep it in a safe place and you don't uh, discard it <laughs> and you keep track of it. it it's, an, it's a good thing to have. So how will we use the notebook in this class? Well, 
we are going to use it to document pretty much everything we do. And we're also going to use it to untest as a reference for you to help, help you do well, except for the file. So a lot of people ask, well, are notebooks obsolete now that we have laptops and we have Word documents? Could I just open a new Word document and keep all my notes electronically? Yes, you could. But as an engineer, you'll be spending a lot of time out on the floor. You'll be places where laptops aren't appropriate, like sometimes I'm in board meetings where there's no electronic cloud. And sometimes you just can't have a laptop with you. Like in our liquid production facility, you know, I would have to suit up in a Tyvek suit and go out and work in an area where there's a lot of spills and my laptop would get destroyed if I took it out there. So you just have to use your best common sense and realize and choose the best tool for the job. Sometimes you just grab a notebook and you go out and you're doing your work. So when would you use a Word document? So I would always have a Word document open while I was working with my vendors. I'd make a little note of what date we had a phone conversation, what we discussed, and what the points were. And I can't tell you how many times I went back to those engineering Word documents and I would say, well, vendor, on this date we talked about this, and I'm just calling a follow-up to see where we are on this. And you know, sometimes they'll forget, you'll forget. Sometimes there's not an email that tracks your conversation. So I would even copy emails into a Word document if it was relevant enough to keep track of. You know, because you can't always trust a server to file to keep track of all your documents sometimes. Um, keep just know that your um, engineer notebook is a legal document. We've gone over that. We've talked about how to correct mistakes. You just cross it out, put your initials by it, and then put the correct answer. And then we never tear out pages. Why? Well, it leads to further investigation and scrutiny that's not really necessary if you just put a line through what isn't needed anymore. And plus, there's full transparency. No agency or auditing board thinks you're trying to hide something that way. Let's see, we've looked at a few examples of PL2W notebooks in our slideshow. All right, so make sure you get a copy of the design process and tape it into your notebook. And let's go through now to the design process. So you can click on this link here. It'll take you to the design process or I've logged into my PL2W.org and we'll just go through it that way. So let's go through the design process. I'm gonna click on this link and open this one for me. All right. So the design process is a systematic problem solving strategy with criteria and constraints used to develop many possible solutions to solve or satisfy human needs or wants and to narrow down the possible solutions to one final choice. This is a good thing, definition to have in your engineering notebook if, because um, you'll very likely see it on the test again. So if this were my engineering notebook, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So in my engineering notebook, I would open up to uh, in my table of contents, which I've already filled out for today. Remember, page one, titled the design process, date, 8, 24, or 25, whatever day you're watching this. I'd now turn to page one, where I have taped my engineering uh, design process into the book right here. And over here in this open area, I would start writing the definition of the design process. You'll need that on the test. So I'm gonna leave it up here. Let's see, go back to share screen. I'm gonna share this one. And share. So go ahead and pause the video here until you have this definition written in your engineering notebook. Okay, now you've got that done. Let's let's move forward here. The design process is a very iterative process. That means that it the steps we use, we go back and use again and again and again. It, we oftentimes learn from our mistakes, and so we want to go back and fix and make improvements. So that's really like the path from identifying a problem to presenting a solution is really straightforward. And so that's why we repeat several steps. So you'll want the definition of iterative in your notes for sure. It's a good one to have, and you'll probably see it again on the test. Iterative means it's a process that repeats a series of steps over and over until the desired outcome is obtained. If I were an online engineering student, I would make sure that the definition of iterative is in my engineering notebook on page one. So you can pause this screen here until you have this written down in your notebook. All right, let's talk a little bit about the engineering um, process or the design process. So the first step is to define the problem, then we generate concepts, then we develop a solution, then we construct and test our solution, evaluate it, and then present it. Now, I've never really seen a case where we just go through the entire loop and we're all the way done. We typically go back and repeat several steps until we get it right. But the first step is defining the problem. Problems exist everywhere, and 
some people may think one thing's a problem and other people may not. So for example, I like to smoke meats and it takes about nine to 12 hours to smoke, smoke a pork shoulder. And to me, that's not a problem. But if people in my house want to eat sooner, it becomes a problem for them. So that's an example of how one thing can be a problem for somebody and it's not a problem for somebody else. So one of the things to evaluate when you're defining your problem is who says it's a problem? Is it just you? Well, you might need to get some other people to corroborate that. What are the needs and wants of the stakeholders? Uh, what is a stakeholder? It's basically anyone affected by the decision. Here's the actual definition that you'll definitely want in your PLTW notebook for the test. It's an individual, group, or organization who may affect, be affected by, or perceive itself to be affected by a decision, activity, or outcome of a project. Go ahead and pause this to make sure you get this in your notebook for the test. All right, another question is, are there prior solutions to the problem? What have other people done to help cook this food faster? And you can usually use that as a springboard into your own ideas. Is the problem worth solving? Well, maybe, maybe it's not. What are the specific criteria and constraints required to solve the problem? A lot of times this plays a big role in determining what is a viable outcome for the, for the final solution. So to prove that your problem is valid and justified, you wanna make sure that you include a clear justification of why the problem is worth solving. I mean, if you're talking about solving global warming, you've got some, some justification there. You wanna include multiple comprehensive considerations from varying viewpoints. I mean, not everybody believes global warming is a problem worth solving. Some people believe that we should be focusing on different things. And so you wanna make sure that you take into account all those different viewpoints. Include a description of a community or group of people who'd benefit from solving the problem. So if you're gonna spend time solving it, make sure you have, you list some people who will benefit from that, from your work. And you wanna provide credible and properly referenced sources for those. So let's go ahead and talk about the next step, generating concepts. This is basically brainstorming, and we'll get more into brainstorming solutions here in the future. But for now, just know that once you've generated the problem, you wanna brainstorm and come up with very I varying ideas. <clears throat> um, when you, a lot of ideas will come from researching the problem and from consulting other people. Brainstorming is best done as a group activity because people, have you ever, um, <clears throat> have you ever heard the story of, you know, the car accident where five people see it and the police officer comes on scene and asks the five people what happened and he gets five, he or she gets five different stories. Well, that's exactly what brainstorming is like. We all see things differently, and so we all have different things to contribute. So the more people you can involve in a brainstorming session, uh, you know, up to the limits of um, you know, what's feasible, then the better off you'll be. Applying STEM principles helps with that. Let's talk about developing solutions. Steps three, four, and five are very, they overlap quite a bit, and they're very iterative. So after you develop a solution and you construct and test it, then you evaluate it, if it works, great. If not, you're right back to developing more solutions. And we've all been there. And that's okay to have some solutions fail. That This is how we learn. So if the solution is found to not work out well, then you got to come back and start over. And that's okay. Next is constructing and testing. And that's where you basically build a prototype. And prototyping has been made so much easier with the advent of additive manufacturing. So additive manufacturing is where we add materials one to another until we get a prototype. So like 3D printing would be a good example of additive manufacturing. So in this step, you construct and test your prototype. And remember, you always need to collect data so that you can remember what happened. And the engineering notebook is a great way to record that and a great place to store it. And then lastly, you evaluate your solution. Is it effective? Does it meet the design criteria and constraints? Does it need to be redesigned? So those are things to look at. And then lastly, if you've got a winner of a solution, then we take it to present. And that's where the engineering notebook really is invaluable. It records all your ideas, all your brainstorming, and it's the go-to place for creating your presentation. All right, this is a list of some of the deliverables that you can get from different steps of the design process. We'll talk about each one of these later on in class, but just for now, know that a design brief helps you define the problem. A decision matrix helps you generate concepts. A graphical model helps you develop a solution. A working model and a test report help you in the constructing and testing phase. And project recommendations, that type of document is associated with evaluating the solution. And when you present the solution, you can put it in a portfolio or a formal presentation like PowerPoint. 
for some of the resources that you've got available to you once you get your PLTW username and password. And I hope to get those to you here after Wednesday so you can log in and have access to this. The, this PLTW site will be our textbook, your textbook for the course. And as soon as Encore and BSD Canvas sync, some of the students will drop off the roles and we'll be able to get those PLTW usernames and passwords issued out to you. So let's go back to our lesson plan for the day. We just finished going through the design process and let's go through next and talk about the assignments. So today there will be no assignments. However, please make sure that you have completed the following assignments. Uh, number one, please have taken the disclosure quiz and the unit one pretest. Uh, you will do those on DSD Canvas. And then tomorrow, let's see, today is 824 Monday. Today they are just, um, Weber State is fixing the error that they had in electronically cataloging this course. So tomorrow you should be able to register for CE credit for this class. Again, the directions for that are back up here under, let's see, let's go to the right place. So if we go to our Canvas course and we go to the main page under administrative documents, we come down to how do I register for concurrent enrollment. So tomorrow you'll want, or on starting Tuesday, 825, you'll want to uh, go through this process and get, get registered for your credits. Let's go back to our lesson here. So let's discuss how would you set up your engineering notebook if you were working as an engineer at work? Let's say you show up and all they give you is a legal pad. How would you set it up? Well, would you go out and buy something similar to this or would you just make the legal pad work? Just a few things to think through. Would you want to number your pages? Would you want to have places for signatures? So just a few logistics to walk through. What incentives do you have to keep your notebook legible? So go ahead and pause and think about this for yourself. All right, now that you've unpaused and thought through your own ideas on that, some of my thoughts are, this notebook will help you on tests. So if you can't read your own handwriting, then it won't do you much good. Also, this notebook is gonna be reviewed by the Utah State Board of Education and by the Weber State University Engineering Department. If they can't read your work here, then they're gonna say that this class might not be a good candidate for college credit and that this student might need some remedial uh, correction. So let's see, let's go through here. What similar processes, let's see, why would, the, why would the design process be useful if you were working as an engineer? Well, what do you think? Go ahead and pause it. All right, now that you've thought this through on your own, the design process is useful as an engineer because it organizes your approach to problems. We don't want to just jump into a problem and start generating solutions before we understand what we're dealing with. So it's a systematized approach that helps us keep our thoughts organized, clear, and we work in a way that, that uh, the sequencing is, is correct. So what similar processes exist in other industries? What do you think? Well, I can think of one. In the scientific community, they use the scientific method. And it's a very similar process to the design process, just specific to their field. All right, we're gonna skip this box plot. Uh, we didn't have quite enough time to get to it in class, so we're gonna kick it until our, our next video here. Um, so what was new to you today? If you've got a friend sitting there close to you, um, or even a stuffed animal, <laughs> wherever you are watching this, discuss what you feel like is still fuzzy or not clear. Um, if you're taking this with a friend, help each other understand, or you can come talk to me if there's any elements here that aren't necessarily clear. Let's see, what we've done for the day, give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, we would dismiss according to New Age policy, uh, but you're at home, so you should be in good shape. I think the big takeaway from today is please come to this class, Portable M5, and get your engineering notebook because you'll be using it in this course quite a bit. Thank you for being here, and we'll see you in the next video.